Well, I received a big box of uh, vacuum tubes from uh, a buddy that was at an estate and picked a bunch of them up. And most of them are in good shape, but one of them was broken. So I think we'll take this opportunity to take this one apart and see how it's constructed. Here's something to feast your eyes on. I just received a box of literally hundreds of different tubes. Like 6H6. Some of these are really quite rare. 6SN7. Literally, this box is completely full. So if any of you guys are looking for old radio tubes, uh, there's a good chance, radio TV tubes, there's a good chance that I might have one. 6SN7GT. Seems to be a fair number of those. 6SN7. Seems to be quite a few of those. But anyway, I've got literally this box is completely full of various different tubes. This one here is a high voltage. Uh, this one is a a 1G3, that would be a high voltage shunt for a TV. Anyway, um, are you guys looking for some old vintage tubes? I might have what you're looking for. They all appear to be in good shape. None of them are broken, so none of them are broken yet. They might get broken, but uh, anyway, I figured I'd just show you guys this real quick and uh, one of the tubes was broken, so we'll 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 take this one apart. One was broken. We have one casualty. So this was a casualty in that big box of tubes that I was given. One that's broken, so I figured maybe we'll take this one apart since it's already broken. We'll we'll deconstruct this tube and just see what uh, what is in it, what type of tube it is, because inquiring minds want to know. So we'll just clip the cap off this one. This could have been like a a, uh, a horizontal output tube or a vertical output tube from a TV, or it could have been a radio tube. I don't know exactly what type this is. Some um, some sets had the plate connected or the, to the, uh, the cap on the top, like some of the television tubes. And this looks like this is one of those instances, so that would have been the high voltage supply. Other... Um, types of tubes they actually connected the uh, screen on the outside to shield the tube itself and others had it connected to the grid so it all really depends on the design but this one here you can see that this one here is connected right to the top here so this was actually the uh, the plate so that would have had high voltage so I'm, I'm gonna guess that that was probably a horizontal output type tube for a television of the day but let's just take a look at the construction of this tube itself. As you can see, this is for, for people that don't have any experience with vacuum tubes. Uh, vacuum tubes were all made by hand and then they were of course sealed up and evacuated. This was all done before we had uh, had machines to make them. So they were all these were all spot welded and put together by um, a team of assembly people working on an assembly line and basically one person was responsible for one element somebody would one person would wind the grid another person would form the plates you know and then another person would start assembling them but uh, we can deconstruct this very much how it was put together so we'll start by removing the uh, the mica the mica insulator which is what holds everything in place as you can see they have a series of holes punched in so when they put the the tube together um, the, the, the base itself was actually mounted on a glass a, a glass form with the wires coming in so that they could connect everything and then everything else was just added one step at a time so if we start removing things like if I remove this top I don't know what the, I don't remember what this piece was called that just held the top on it's a shield of some type but if we cut this just remove this from the top here like to remove the try to remove everything take it apart the way they put it together without uh, breaking too many things because I'll have to clip off the uh, the 
don't know whether it's made out of tungsten or what it's made out of, but man, it's, some of this is pretty, uh, pretty heavy duty. It might be tungsten. Because that is really, really, that is really tough to cut through. I have a feeling it's it's tungsten just because of the heat that would be involved inside the center of the tube here, right next to the, the heated cathode. Now, can I pull this insulator off now without breaking it? Probably not. To cut some more, cut some more down a bit. I didn't want to sh sh shred the insulator, but there it is. Take the insulator off. I'll probably just release some asbestos because this being mica, mica had naturally occurring asbestos in it. But uh, mica insulator, much like was used later for uh, the insulators for transistors, for large transistors that would isolate them electrically from the, uh, the heat sink. These rings that you see here, these are called the getters. So what the getter was, was it was a, a, a chemical that was uh, applied in here. And once the tube was evacuated, they used an induction heater to heat the getter up and cause it to burn and flash the getter, as it was called. And what that would do is that would burn up any residual oxygen that was remaining in the tube. And that's what caused the silver, uh, you know, the silver dome on, on top of the tube or on the side. That was the deposits from the getter uh, attaching to the glass. And they would continue to be reactive so that if any oxygen or any air were to leak into the tube over its life, they would react with the oxygen and bond with it and remove it so that it wouldn't affect the operation of the tube. And it would eventually, if the, if the tube had a slight air leak, eventually the getter would start to turn a milky white on the inside of the glass. And once the getter was used up, then the oxygen would get in and destroy the tube. But it would extend the life if there was a minor leak. It would extend the life of the tube. And that was its job. If I straight note the crimp here I should be able to pull the rest of the uh, the plate out and keep everything else intact there we go so this is the plate this is your the, the electrons are attracted to the, the positive plate, so this is the positive, the anode, basically. And inside here, we've got the cathode and we've got the grid, and this would be, looks like a power beam tube. So what we've got here, we've got a metal structure, and then you can see the grid surrounding the heated cathode. Let's zoom the camera in. The grid is just a series of fine wires, as you can see. If I can get any closer, I guess that's about the limit that the camera's going to go. But that's good. We can get a good close-up here of this one. And we'll see how many grids. This is a suppressor, this one. So it, it, it causes the electrons to flow out in a beam. So this sits around like, like that. And it causes the electrons to form a beam, a narrow beam, <clears throat> as opposed to as opposed to flying out in all directions that you'd find on, say, a conventional, uh, conventional uh, triode or, or a conventional pentode or, or a different design of tube. This one's a power beam tube, looks like. If we remove this... There's if I open this up, 
and this is probably nickel or something relatively soft, this metal. I can, I can cut through it, no problem. Damaged my grid. <laughs> Let's cut this one down here too. So this has two separate grids. This tube looks like it would have the control grid, and one of them is a suppressor. And, uh, and then there's this power beam forming plate. There's a the cathode. We can pull the cathode out. And then that sat over top of the heater. Now you can see the heater. So that's the heater wire there. And its job is just to get hot and form the heat for the actual cathode, which is, this is what's coated with the electron emitting uh, material they coat the cathode with that's what this white material is probably toxic if I apply power to the heater we'll watch it burn up Let's just uh, give it some juice. We should watch this thing uh, burn up pretty good here. We can identify which pins go to the heater, which looks like this one and is it that one. Yeah, that's the one there. Feel feels like it's getting warm. Drawing two amps. Give it a bit more volts. There it goes. This might have been a 12 volt tube, I'm giving it to 12 volts now. We'll get it a little warmer. And I popped it. Took 20 volts to burn that one up. It would have burned up anyway because it's exposed to oxygen, but uh, now it's turned yellow. I burned it up good. Still a bit warm. Anyway, I think we'll remove the outer grid first, so let's just cut that one away. beam forming plate whatever they call that someone knows what it is not me tubes were uh, on their way out when I got into the business so even though I did work on tube equipment early in my career it was uh, rather limited as to what I did with tubes I still appreciate them though, I still use a tube amplifier, in fact I use that pretty much every day. grids there's the outer grid this is usually what they refer to as a suppressor and then the inner grid here this is the control grid so this would have been a pentode power beam pentode we, we know that because it has five elements 
So you've got your, your cathode is the one element. You've got your, your control grid or your screen is your uh, second element. Suppressor grid is the third element. Or is this the screen? This might be the screen. That's the control grid and this is the screen. And then you've got your suppressor, which is this is this is the one that forms it into a beam. And then you've got the uh, the plate. So that's a, that's a pento tube taken apart. If I cut off this one, we can remove this, the screen from the filament. The filament was just a piece of tungsten wire with a coating on it. This has this is an insulation. That's why this didn't burn up right away. It it actually broke where the where there was uh, none of this insulation. Uh, this keeps the air away from it. Believe it or not, you know normally it's it's the reason this coating is there is to prevent a short to the cathode. Right, it's they they coat the filament wire, which is a piece of tungsten, and put that inside to heat the cathode. And this is what happens when you get it. What's called a heater to cathode short. It's what happened. What causes a heater to cathode short is this breaks down. This coating breaks down and causes the heater to short to the cathode. So that's a heater to cathode short. This is just a tungsten wire. No different than what you would have in a conventional incandescent light bulb. If I connect this up to my power supply here, we'll let it burn. The insulation is uh, not getting a connection here. There we go. Ah, uh, yes. Burned it up, but good. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the anatomy of an old vacuum tube gone on longer than it probably should have and yes believe it or not this metal here made a difference there were, that was something that was quite often pr proprietary it's copper but it's just got a coating on it and uh, a lot of times when they manufactured tubes the coating that they put on this copper was proprietary so that was a uh, Different brands of tubes use a different type of coating on the actual copper. You can see the you can see the copper in here, right? But they use a different type of coating on it that, that improved the uh, way the electrons were absorbed by it. Old tube technology. Anyway, that's uh, an old radio tube or an old TV tube torn down. Hope you guys uh, an old one made by Rogers. Hope and, and made in Canada. I would say this one would have been because Rogers was a Canadian company. Thanks for watching.